Air traffic controllers don't just deal with civilian traffic. Military flights operate year-round at any time of the day at both military bases and civilian airports. They have a special kind of traffic pattern called the overhead pattern, which is significantly different from the standard airport traffic pattern. My name is Kyle Warner. I'm an air traffic control student here at the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. We'll show you what an overhead pattern is, how aircraft fly the pattern, and some techniques for working them into other kinds of traffic, today on ATCAST. Thank you. Jeffrey 1264, Boston, Grand Texas, Ramp, November, and Alpha. Boston Tower, Gulf Stream, 719, I'm from Boston, County, Island, 4 Ryan Bridge. Thank you, sir. It's 741, it's taken off. 741, Boston, Gulf Stream, Texas, Boston, 737, just inside, no, no, my call, I'm going to land. That's what you're going to land. 1005. Hello, 17, thanks for the service. Come on, it's Fox, VFR, for the change. Zero, signaling back. Hello, 117, okay, good night, now. Bob Concannon joins me today from the Grand Forks Air Force Base to talk about the overhead pattern. Bob? Thank you, Kyle. I'm Bob Concannon. I'm here to talk to you today about the overhead pattern. Um, I, I have an Air Force background. I flew A-10s and F-117s in the Air Force, besides T-37s and T-38s in training. What we're going to talk about today and look at is uh, efficiently landing aircraft and as air traffic controllers, how this is going to affect you and your job. So if we did, uh, took a normal pattern, we had um, pipers in the uh, pattern out at Grand Forks International, and they're coming around, uh, th let's say, halfway, they're halfway down the downwind leg. <clears throat> normal time for them to get to about a half mile final is about 90 seconds. Okay. Now on the other hand, if uh, you have a force ship check in, and it would be Dakota check, two, three, four, that's what you hear on the radio. Um, and the next thing you might hear is um, Grand Forks Tower. Dakota's 10 miles to the south to land. T air traffic controller would report, Roger Dakota, report initial. Okay. The next time you'll hear from this four ship is when they're about a mile out directly on final at whatever the initial altitude is for your airport and that's the pattern altitude that they would find in, the, in your in-flight guide. The four ship comes up in an echelon pattern and what you're going to want to do is the most efficient thing is for as soon as the flight lead is over the numbers he will go into the brake okay and the brake is where he starts a hard 180 degree turn will put his gear down configure for landing with gear and flaps as that particular aircraft does come out to where he's about a 45 degree from the numbers looking over his shoulder there's 45 degrees from the numbers, start a final turn, would like to roll out on a one mile final. If we think about this from a time frame, from the time that the first airplane pitches, goes into the brake, till the last number four actually is on the ground, is about 90 seconds. So when you look at it, the time that it takes for the civil aircraft to go around the pattern, to the time it takes for four aircraft to come up initial pitch out and land, it's actually faster for the four fighters to come in and land. This is going to happen at different air speeds than you're used to. With the Piper, and he's flying at 95, 90 to 100 uh, on downwind, probably going to be 85 on base, putting the flaps down, 60 to, um, 60 to 80 probably on final, depending on uh, particular configuration for that airplane. You have to understand that <clears throat> most modern fighters are going to come up initial between 250 and 350. Um, those are the, just the normal air speeds that are going to fly because of the high performance the wings uh, that they have. They're just, it's easier for them to fly. They have waiver, waivers for flying over 250 below 10,000 feet. So Dakota comes up initial. They're able to pitch out and land very efficiently, very effectively. Those aircraft also usually have waivers uh, for spacing on the runway. Uh, you'd expect that uh, on a 12,000 foot runway, all four airplanes may well be on the runway at the same time. They need probably a 3,000 foot spacing between aircraft at touchdown, and then as they roll out, they can compress. So one's going to come out, pitch out. He's going to make a hard left turn here. We're going to do a left hand pattern. He's going to do a hard left hand turn. Three, two, three, and four will continue straight up the runway. As they go up the runway, five seconds, when, when two sees lead go into the brake, he counts one, two. When he gets to five, he goes 
into his break and three and four continue on and five seconds later three breaks five seconds after that four breaks what we'll have is the first aircraft doing his 180 degree turn just over the numbers maybe three to four thousand feet down the runway two will be making his 180 degree turn and then three and then four and you will actually have four aircraft on the inside downwind normally four will have pitched out and be rolling out on the inside downwind as the lead aircraft is starting his final turn okay so this break this is this hard 180 degree turn that we start to line up on our inside downwind then configure uh, speed brakes gear flaps uh, however that normal configuration is for that aircraft slowing down to their final uh, their final turn airspeed it's going to be a little faster because they're in a turn the whole way this is a continuous turn to final not they won't roll out on a base continuous turn to final get the nose down and the goal is to go through as if you had a one mile out on final 300 feet up a hoop in the sky you want to fly through that hoop basically the same place that an airplane would be as if they were flying an ILS final at one mile. Any airplane wants to be at 300 feet a mile out. So they're going to try to fly through that spot. So we've come up initial, we've, 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 we've done our break, we're on the downwind, all the aircraft are configured, we made this continuous turn to final, then the first aircraft touches down and what they'll do is if they're using spree brakes, normally they'll close their spree brakes to try to get spacing so the air traffic controllers don't have to worry about these all these airplanes landing right together on the one, runway. They'll actually roll out a ways before they hit their brakes and then start slowing down on the runway to use the in part of the runway. Number two will be coming around the final turn, touching down, doing the same thing, rolling out. But at the end of the runway, at the far end of the runway, those four aircraft may be catching up with, with each other. That's fine. That's normal. That's it's how it's done at most military bases and if they come to your civil aircraft air base they'll probably be expect to do that um, if there's some regulation at your base that you can't do that then you need to tell them I've personally done this with a number of different types of aircraft at civil airports and at those airports once again uh, we will fly whatever is written as the overhead altitude if for any reason the air traffic controllers would like us to be someplace else if they'll just tell us what they want now, we understand that there's spacing, just like um, there's spacing between regular civil aircraft, possibly for wake turbulence. Okay, we, are, we expect to be given, do this for spacing for wake turbulence. Honestly, uh, I've been places where they told us to delay our final turn. So, no kidding, the whole four ship may extend out and then be on a, roll out further and be on a two mile final. Okay, and then that's just, you just delay the turn to final or you delay the break, sometimes well past the departure in for other traffic. We have the same uh, rules and regulations that other folks do for wake turbulence behind small aircraft and heavies. So if you need a one minute spacing, you just put this whole unit. But think of that four ship or two ship or three ship, whatever the flight of fighters coming in as a unit and use them as a chunk. They're going to go wherever they're going to, wherever lead goes, two, three, and four are going to follow. If we were to come in on an IFR flight plan, and we can come in as a force ship on an IFR flight plan, they, the uh, ATC treats us as a unit. We move radio frequencies. We do the check-in, like I said earlier, when everybody's where they need to be. <clears throat> and then the, the, air, the flight control, the, the flight lead talks to the next controller, tells what we're going to do. At some point, this is a VFR maneuver. This is not uh, an IFR. We wouldn't come in IFR if there was bad weather uh, and land this way. So, you know, this is a VFR maneuver. Once we're, we're VFR airfield in sight, they normally say, okay, we're, you're going to cancel IFR at this time, contact tower. Thanks, Kyle. Back to you. Thanks, Bob. Now we'll go to Dan Lindsay in the tower lab to explain some techniques for handling aircraft in the overhead pattern. Dan? Thanks, Kyle. We're going to start out by going over some general guidelines about the overhead pattern, and then we'll look at the specific steps involved in the maneuver. Then we'll see what this looks like in the tower lab, and go over some tips for controlling the pattern. First, our simulation is going to be slightly different than what Bob talked about. Instead of having a flight of four aircraft, you'll only be dealing with a single aircraft. And like Bob mentioned, this whole maneuver will happen very fast. Until you've actually done it in the lab, 
you probably don't realize just how fast it is. If it's a fighter you're dealing with, they really will be flying this at 300 plus knots, so you have to pay attention to where your other traffic is and think about how you're going to fit this fighter into your overall traffic situation. The good news is, because of the speeds involved, you'll find that you can often get your military aircraft through the pattern well in advance of any traffic in your VFR pattern or any commercial aircraft on final approach. Use the speed to your advantage whenever possible. At the same time, in some circumstances you will need to adjust how the pattern works to accommodate other traffic. You can do this by changing where the aircraft breaks, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Don't forget about wake turbulence separation. Most military fighters are large, so you will likely have to give cautionary wake turbulence advisories to your other VFR traffic. The overhead pattern altitude is 500 feet above the VFR traffic pattern at Academy Airport. But keep in mind that the military aircraft will be descending through the VFR pattern during their turn onto final. So any VFR aircraft arriving after the fighter will be passing through its flight path. Also, if you have a fighter conducting a landing after a heavy aircraft has arrived or departed, you will need to provide a cautionary wake turbulence advisory just like you would for any other VFR aircraft in that situation. Runway separation is also important to remember. Most fighters are category three, so you will have to apply appropriate runway separation between them and your other arrivals and departures. Finally, the overhead pattern is not the same thing as close traffic. Let's say a fighter wants to do two passes, a low approach and then a full stop landing. It has to fly the entire overhead pattern for each landing. So basically, once it finishes its low approach, it will have to re-enter initial and go through the pattern again. Coming up next, we'll look at the step-by-step -step procedure you'll use when aircraft request the overhead pattern. Most military fighters are considered to be what weight classification? The correct answer is A, large. What same runway separation category do most fighters fall under? The correct answer is C. Like most commercial jets, military fighters are Category 3 aircraft. Now let's break down this maneuver step by step. Required phraseology is highlighted in yellow. The aircraft will call you about 7 to 8 miles out on final and request the overhead pattern. Your first step is to instruct the pilot to report initial runway 28 right or 28 left as appropriate. Like a VFR traffic pattern, a standard overhead pattern has left hand turns. So if you're using runway 28 right, you will also have to add the phrase right turns to this instruction. For example, report initial runway 28 right, right turns. Initial is a point three to five miles from the approach end of the runway. At Academy Airport, the outer marker is initial for whichever runway you happen to be using. I mentioned earlier that this is a VFR maneuver. Once the aircraft reaches the initial point, its IFR flight plan is automatically canceled and you can treat it as a VFR aircraft from that point on. Once the pilot reports initial, your next step is to provide instructions on where to break. Aircraft will normally break over the approach end of the runway, but you can have them break at midfield or departure end depending on your traffic situation. You do this by saying break at approach end, report break. Step three is the clearance. Once the pilot reports the break, you should clear them for landing. The phraseology is the same for military aircraft as it is for anyone else. Runway 28 right, cleared low approach, or runway 28 right, cleared to land. If the aircraft is doing a low approach, your last step is to instruct the pilot to enter initial runway 28 right, report initial. The pilot will proceed back to initial and the process begins again. Now let's see what this looks like in the tower lab. Academy Tower, Fork 09, inbound from the overhead, runway 28 right. Fork 09 or Academy Tower, enter initial runway 28 right, right turns. Roger, enter initial, Fork 09. Fork 09 on initial. Fork 09 or break approach end, report break. Break approach end, report break, Fork 09. Tower, Fork 09, reporting break. 
Fork 09er, runway 28 right, cleared low approach. Clear low approach, Fork 09. Fork 09er, enter initial, report initial. Re entering initial, Fork 09er, we'll report initial. Academy Tower, Fork 09er, reporting initial. Fork 09er, Academy Tower. Break approach in, report break. Break approach in, report break, Fork 09. Fork 09 reporting break. Fork 09 runway 28 right, clear to land. Runway 28 right, clear to land, Fork 09. There are a number of ways to deal with the overhead pattern, but the methods you choose are going to depend on your traffic situation. Here are a few suggestions. First, be aware of the speed differences between aircraft. For example, a Piper Warrior may be flying the pattern at around 90 knots, while an F-16 will be flying the overhead pattern at 300 knots. Second, since this maneuver will be happening between 250 to 350 knots, and most commercial jets will come down final at less than 250 knots, and be slowing down even more as they get closer to the airport, you may find that you have more space than you think to get the military aircraft through the pattern and land it. Third, you can use the different brake points to help with spacing from IFR and VFR aircraft. If you want the military plane to get through the pattern as quickly as possible, have it brake at the approach end. But if you need more space from other traffic, you can have it brake at midfield or at the departure end. Finally, if the traffic situation just isn't working out the way you want, have the aircraft break off and re-enter initial and start over again. Up next, we'll review the overhead pattern and revisit some suggestions for working it into your other traffic. At what point do aircraft conducting the overhead maneuver become VFR? The answer is B. Aircraft entering the overhead pattern become VFR once they reach initial. True or false? The overhead pattern works the same way as closed traffic in a VFR traffic pattern. The answer is false. Aircraft wishing to conduct multiple landings in the overhead pattern must return to initial each time. Let's review the key points you should take away from this episode. The overhead pattern consists of four parts. They are initial, the brake, downwind, and a continuous turn onto final. The overhead pattern procedure also consists of four steps. First, instruct the aircraft to report initial. Then tell the pilot where to brake. They can brake at the approach end, midfield, or departure end of the runway. Next, provide a landing clearance. Finally, if the pilot is making multiple passes, instruct him or her to re-enter initial. Once the aircraft reaches initial on its first pass, it becomes VFR and can be treated as such until it conducts its final landing. How you deal with the overhead pattern will depend on your traffic situation, but here are some general guidelines. Use the speed of the military jet to your advantage. Once you've done this a few times, you'll get a feel for when you can or cannot get them in ahead of other VFR and IFR traffic. If you want to get the aircraft through the pattern as quickly as possible, have it break at the approach end. If you need more time or spacing, have it break at midfield or at the departure end. Finally, if the situation isn't working out, have the aircraft re-enter initial and try again. That's it from me. 
Back to you, Kyle. Thanks, Dan. On behalf of UND Air Traffic Control, the Student Air Traffic Controller Association, and the Aerospace Network, thanks for watching. My name is Kyle Warner, Frequency Change Approved. Learn more about UND Air Traffic Control and watch more episodes of ATCAST by logging on to www.undsatca.org. Students may interactively test their knowledge by taking the ATCAST quizzes on SATCA's Easy LMS page. ATCAST can also be downloaded for free to your portable media device. Just search for ATCAST on iTunes U. Thank you.